Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would talk about orchid children and dandelion children. Orchid children and dandelion. Orchids and dandelions. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. The reason why I'm talking about orchid children today is because patron Jennifer wrote in about this a while back and asked me to do an episode on orchid children and dandelion children. So here we go. All right. Well, first off, what the heck is orchid children and dandelion children? Well, at first, this might sound like a bunch of woo, you know, like auras and stuff. I'm an orchid child. I'm a dandelion child. What's your sign? I'm a, I'm a Libra. Uh, it, it can sound like that. And sometimes it's sort of written about in the lay public as if it's sort of this. But actually, it's a legit area of research in the fields of psychology and biology and other, you know, legit fields. So let's look into the theory here. So the theory goes, and according to research, seemingly, 80% of children are dandelion children-ish, 80-ish percent, and about 20% of kids have been found to be orchid children. Wait, did I say that right? 80% are dandelion and 20% are orchid. And the reason why they name them dandelions and orchids is because dandelions are hardy. They can grow in almost any environment. When dandelion children are stressed out, their stress response only kicks in for a short amount of time. And they recover quickly from that stress, both psychologically and biologically. You know, stressors like getting in trouble or moving to a new home or grief and loss or starting kindergarten, for that matter, or ending kindergarten. These are all stressful events for children. And the idea goes and the theory goes and some of the research goes is that 80% of children seem to react to those kinds of stresses with a normal, quote unquote, normal response or a dandelion response, which is they have an upsurge of stress measures, biological markers, biomarkers of stress. But then, you know, after a couple of days, they return to normal. Whereas for orchid children, again, 20% of kids-ish, these orchid children are highly sensitive. And they're called orchids because orchids are highly sensitive. These children have excessive or long-lasting effects from stress. And there are biological markers of this, like um, cortisol levels. They'll measure cortisol levels among children as they go through different stresses. And they find that some children, a, a small or a minority of children, tend to retain those cortisol levels for much longer than other kids. And... Uh, as as dandelion kids. So in other words, orchid children are very sensitive to stress and they don't recover very fast. And they find that this can lead to psychiatric problems, behavioral problems, biological problems, etc. So they can actually become ill more often because of stress because we all know that stress can affect those kinds of things. And this makes sense. You know, we're all born with different dispositions and it makes sense that some of us are born with different baseline responses for stress, different, different susceptibility to stress and, and different, um, you know, shall I say, programming regarding how, how long we should recover from stress. And some people are just born more resilient or less sensitive to stress than other people. Um, and of course, the researchers in this area are smart to point out that environment plays a role in this too, that it's impossible to know how much it, it is involved in biology and how much of it is, in, is also involved in, in one's environment. For instance, if you mistreat a child, then it can turn them into an orchid child essentially because they're, they just become more sensitive to the world because they've been mistreated. So, um, but it appears that biology might play a role as well. And, you know, this all makes sense to me. And if 
we can detect these differences in children, we might be able to tailor their environment to help them cope better. Or if we can identify ORCID children earlier, we might be able to help parents and help schools and other people that are around that child to uh, better assist that child in, in their development. There's also some research that suggests that highly sensitive children or ORCID children are better able to achieve things if they are raised in a particular way. And, and this is a very interesting point because the idea that some kids are sensitive is, or, you know, that some kids are more reactive to stress, you know, that, that doesn't, doesn't take, it's not a big stretch. I think anyone who's been around kids knows that there are differences, even among siblings. You'll just, you'll see different siblings just having completely different reactions to stress or to sadness or anger or frustration, you know, you'll have two sisters that are just a couple years apart. And one of them just completely melts down at the first sign of any kind of frustration. And the other one just blows it off like there's like, it's no big deal. So it's pretty clear that biology plays a role in our, you know, baseline psychologies and baseline reactivity. So, you know, all that makes sense. But They've also found with further research that ORCID children or highly sensitive children, if they're given a non-stressful environment or a good enough environment, then they can actually do much better than dandelion children. So the idea goes, and there seems to be evidence of this, that highly sensitive or ORCID children, they, they, they're, they're, they have a much wider variety in their achievement in terms of the kinds of outcomes we look at at kids. When we look at grades, we look at psychiatric problems, we look at health, we look at um, you know social adjustment, that kind of stuff. When we look at those things, we've, th there seems to be some initial evidence that ORCID children, when they're stressed out, they do really bad. But when they're raised in good enough environments, then they tend to do really, really well. So. Whereas dandelion children are less affected by their environment, in other words. So dandelion children, if they're raised in a stressful environment, they're, they're, they do okay, but they don't do as bad as an orchid kid would do in a stressful environment. Whereas in a good enough environment, a dandelion child will, you know, so just in terms of, let's just look at grades. If you're raised in a good enough environment, a dandelion child will get A's and B's, whereas an orchid child will get all A pluses. <laughs> Where in a stressful environment, a dandelion child will get, you know, C's, D's, and F's, whereas an orchid child in a stressful environment will get all F's. So that's just a crude way of, of putting it. Um, so there seems to be some some research suggesting this, and. This is not. This is um, very similar to the research in the literature regarding gifted children. Gifted children. I've done an episode on gifted children. You can go into the archives and find that one. I interviewed an expert, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, Lisa Erickson, about it. Basically, it's believed that gifted children are more sensitive to their environments in the same way that orchid children are. So I wonder if the gifted children literature people are upset that there's this new topic called orchid children because they've been, there's, there's been a lot of literature about, so gifted children, from what I understand in the literature, gifted children as a research topic and a literature topic has been, a, been around for a while. Uh, and they've been actually using the phrase highly sensitive, I think. And then all of a sudden there's this orchid child thing that comes out of nowhere and uh, seems to be getting a lot of uh, press, probably because of the catchy name like Orchid Child. Anyway, and, and just by the way, I kind of have a little problem with Orchid Dandelion because orchids are more expensive and are, according to many cultures, much more beautiful than dandelions. And so it privileges Orchid Child. I mean, I, I understand the benefit of of trying to depathologize these kids. That's why we might avoid terms like highly sensitive and we, why we might want to apply words like gifted or, or orchid children. But I don't know. It just seems like b there's a better label for this sort of thing. <laughs> I don't know what that is. 
but uh, uh, orchid child, dandelion child, it just sounds a little classist to me. And I could see how people could take it to that. Of course, the research doesn't show that upper class kids are more likely to be orchid children. It has nothing to do with that. But I don't know. It just, I, I could see uh, if I was a kid. I could see myself really wanting to be an orchid child and not wanting to be a dandelion child. I don't know. Maybe other people love dandelions, but um, anyway. So in other words, uh, so gifted children have, uh, the idea is that they're very sensitive to their environments. Essentially, the theory goes, and there's some evidence to suggest that their nervous system is just more receptive to the world. They feel more things they're highly sensitive. Their brains are working faster. Their, their neurons are just more likely to fire, if that makes any sense. And if you give these gifted, highly sensitive people a lot of stress, then they react very strongly and become highly affected by that stress. But if you give them a low stress world, then they absorb their world much faster than their peers do. And they tend to shoot past their peers in many of the ways that we measure children. Highly sensitive people, the, the kind of symptoms of this is that they, they don't like particular sensations. They might be very sensitive to loud noises. Essentially, if your nervous system is, is much more amped up than other people, then a loud noise is going to be very loud, right? Or if you have an annoying tag on your shirt that's sort of, you know, if you tend to need to get rid of tags and shirts and sweaters and stuff that drive you nuts, then that's a sign that, that you're highly sensitive or perhaps orchid or perhaps gifted. People who are highly sensitive, their emotions are sometimes bigger and they might think a lot about things. They might think, they might think about a lot, of, a lot of stressful things, actually. And uh, in my experience, when gifted people like something, they really like it. And when they hate something, they really hate it. <laughs> um, and sometimes they can be extremely energetic, even hypomanic in some ways. All right. So parents out there, you might be thinking, well, what am I supposed to do? I, I, how am I supposed to know if my kid's orchid or dandelion or gifted or whatever? Well, the answer is actually so simple in my mind. Basically, it doesn't matter what your kid is. It, it, it's interesting to know, I suppose. But really, for any kid, whether they're dandelion or orchid or some combination, or if they're you know a hydrangea child, it doesn't matter. You need to attempt to create a low stress environment for your children. That's it. If if you're a dandelion child, you're going to benefit from a low stress environment. If you're an orchid child, you're going to really benefit from a low stress environment. So the point is is you don't really need to know if your child is a dandelion or orchid. You you need to help all kids in the same way. It just it just sort of knowing whether or not your kid is dandelion or orchid just means that it might explain why one of your children is just way more sensitive to things. But really, you need to be giving all your kids, whether they're sensitive or not, a, a, a healthy environment to, to grow. Um, and and as a society, we need to be helping all kids to have a healthy environment to grow. We need to help all kids understand their emotions. We need to help all kids help. We need to help them with their coping skills. We need to help all kids with stresses and transitions. We need to avoid exposing all kids to traumatic events or, you know, conflict in families. We need to help all kids avoid being neglected and mistreated, you know, this sort of thing. So again, for dandelion children, these efforts will help them. And for orchid children, this will really help them. <laughs> so that's, you know, the moral of the story. As a final note, I'll just say that some of the literature that I have found, particularly the commentary about some of these studies, the authors have this way of writing about orchid children that's kind of annoying to me. <laughs> it's just a style thing. For instance, here's a quote. I won't name the author because I don't want to make fun of them. But, but the quote goes, Like the orchid, they can have exceptional grace and influence, but they are exceptionally sensitive to the kind of environment in which they're grown, unquote. So, so just that language. Like, like, it, like the orchid, they can have exceptional grace and influence. I don't know. It's just weird to 
look at kids as having grace and influence. I mean, why not just say, like an orchid, they uh, if you give them the right environment, they can bloom into something really you know, spectacular. I don't know. It's just something exceptional grace and influence. I don't know. It just, it, it, it's a, I don't, it, the, the buttons that this literature pushes in me is a classist kind of literature. Cause I think there are semi narcissistic or just full blown narcissistic parents out there who want to believe desperately believe that they are special and therefore their children are very special. And, there is something very special sounding about having your child labeled an orchid child as having exceptional grace and influence. I mean, what influence? What the hell is that supposed to mean? So I, I, um, I get a little worried about this language. And that, that's why I wish that the, you know, the people who birthed this term would have thought of a different label. I, again, I don't know what label that would be. To me, highly sensitive is the best label. Uh, you know, high, you got highly sensitive kids and you have medium sensitive kids and you might even have low sensitive kids. I don't know. But of course, highly sensitive to some people is a derogatory term, right? Oh, you're highly sensitive. You're so sensitive to me that it's, it's not a derogatory term at all. Being sensitive is a wonderful thing, but uh, to some people it's derogatory. Like the word retarded, for instance, that originally, you know, retarded just means slow. And for developmentally delayed or developmentally disabled people, which is, you know, the new terms, they are delayed. And retarded just means delayed. And so, but at some point, because of people using the word retarded as an insult, eventually it became hurtful to people and therefore we don't use that term anymore. And so I agree with the, with the non-usage of retarded, but as with various labels we've applied to various marginalized groups, you know, the word colored, for instance, um, for a time wasn't an insult, but then people used it as an insult for so much, for so much time, it begins to hurt people people's feelings when you use it. And the word sensitive, I'm guessing, you know, is along those lines, which is fine. You know, we don't have to use that word, but, but I don't know if you're out there and you have a different label that, uh, fits better uh, with that doesn't have any kind of narcissistic parent, uh, <laughs> um, flavors to it, then, uh, let me know. You can email me at contact at psychology That's contact at psychology at the end of this episode, I'm just going to mention if you aren't a patron of the podcast, please do so. The person who wrote in, patron Jennifer, she's a patron, and patron uh, patrons get their emails answered much more readily on the on the podcast. So, so you should know that. Plus, just become a patron. You know, you just get to sleep well at night knowing that you're supporting something that you're listening to, which. Um, which I do, the podcasts that I listen to, I absolutely support. Um, also tell a friend or a colleague about the show if you can. Rate us on iTunes if you can. Uh, also join the Facebook fan group, Facebook fan group with, that is moderated by famous patron Lyndon. All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thank you so much for joining me on this and take care of it. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself because you deserve it. Mm-hmm.